Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Sunday with the Braid. As you're uh, coming now into the Zoom room, feel free to let us know where you're Zooming in from the chat. And I'm in, going to encourage everybody uh, to click on speaker view. Make sure you're on speaker view so you're watching the whole program and not the entire gallery. Um, I am Susan Morgenstern. I'm the Bra Braid's producing director. We are so happy to have you all here with us. Uh, please keep uh, letting us know where you are uh, in the chat. I'm going to explain just a few technical items uh, before we begin the event. Your audio function is set to mute. This is to ensure that everybody's able to hear our panelist and moderator without any accidental interruptions. The event is being recorded and it will be made available soon on our website. Uh, if you would like to use the Zoom closed captioning feature, there is a CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You might need to click on the word more to find it. It pulls up a menu that includes the CC closed captions. And that's the way you turn your captions on or off if you don't want them. For your Q&A that follows our moderated discussion, please send your questions directly to me in the chat box. I'll be taking a look at those and, and you can send them at any time during the event. I'll get to as many as I can in the last 10 or 15 minutes of the program. So that's it for me. I will see you later for the Q&A. For now, I'm extremely happy to pass it along to our moderator, Olivia Cohen Cutler. Olivia? Thank you, Susan. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Olivia Cohen Cutler, longtime board member at The Braid and new moderator for Sunday with The Braid. I am excited about my conversation today with art conservator Rosa Lowinger, author of the complex and fascinating Dwell Time, a memoir of art, exile, and repair. Rosa is a Cuban-born American Jewish art conservator and founder of RLA Conservation of Art and Architecture, LLC, the largest woman-owned conservation practice in the United States. Rosa is also a published author, most well-known for Tropicana Nights, the life and times of the legendary Cuban nightclub. Rosa's academic and professional distinctions include the 2008 to 2009 Rome Prize at the American Academy in Rome and fellow status in the American Institute of Conservation and the Association for Preservation Technology. She holds an MA in Art History and Conservation from NYU's Institute of Fine Arts and lectures at universities all over the country and indeed all over the world. Rosa has worked on numerous well-known art restoration and conservation projects, most recently and notably for those lucky enough to live in Los Angeles. She worked on the restoration of Luna Luna, currently a destination art event in Los Angeles, but more about that later. Before we get into our conversation, and because The Braid is a global theater organization, we are delighted to share with you a short piece from Rosa's book, Dwell Time, performed by Braid actress, Heidi Mendez. Heidi? It's 1994 and I'm living in Los Angeles when a 6.7 magnitude earthquake strikes the nearby town of Reseda. I barely finished cleaning up the broken dishes that fell out of my kitchen cabinets and the ceiling plaster that littered my dining room when the phone starts ringing. Before the power is fully back on and people are allowed to leave their houses, I have a week's worth of appointments. A month later, every table and bit of floor space in my studio was crowded with ceramic vases, terracotta busts, plaster reliefs, and dented bronzes. Conservators don't hate what is daunting. We live to problem solve. We unpack the structure of the physical world, untangling the nature of deterioration one step at a time. If only we, like copper alloys, could rewind and be less jaded, less quick to smolder and singe. If only our damaged states of being were 
as beautiful as copper patinas. Terrasso is robust, but it yields too easily to gouges and cracks from settling. It reminds me of my family, those Eastern Europeans who left for America and found themselves settled in the tropics only to be forced to bust out of their foundation within a few decades. It's true of my profoundly damaged mother who had the spark of inspiration and presence of mind to know when it was time to flee the country of her birth that has a way of smashing relationships to smithereens. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of perfect storms that cause deterioration of the personal illness, poverty, untimely deaths, deceptions, exile, persecution, loss of country. Almost nothing comes without intrinsic flaws. It's a law of nature. It's hard not to be pessimistic. But if cons conservation has taught me anything, it's that damage is a prelude to redemption. You can't repair what has never been broken. The key is to be mindful of the decay before the glaze is completely lost, before the bones turn to powder in the sun. When glass breaks, it does so violently, leaving jagged shards that never quite go back together perfectly. But most other deterioration is gradual and unobservable, unless you're paying attention. That's the key, paying attention. Thank you, Heidi. One of so many fantastic stories in Rosa's book. I felt like I got to know Rosa through reading her book, Dwell Time. And it struck me that like The Braid, an organization whose mission is to weave storytelling, performance, and art together while examining each and unique thread Rosa has done the same thing in her book. She has braided together unique aspects of emotional growth, family history, personal accomplishment, and professional mastery in one cohesive whole, while at the same time educating the reader about the work of an art conservator that remains usually unseen. Welcome, Rosa. I'm so excited to talk to you. Thank you so much, Olivia. It's great to be here. And thank you, Heidi, for that beautiful performance. I, I know it's so it's so exciting to see your words come to life, isn't it? <laughs> I know. Okay, so let me ask the first question, Rosa. The title of your book, Dwell Time, is itself unique and just a little mysterious. What does it mean and why did you choose it? Well, the title of, of the book references a a chemical process that happens in conservation. It's a, it's a term related to the work that I do. And it references specifically the amount of time it takes for a material to work upon another material. So for example, um, we wash our hands for 20 seconds with soap because that's the amount of dwell time that soap takes to kill viruses. We only use a uh, hand cleaner uh, for much shorter periods of time because alcohol has a shorter dwell time for killing viruses. And in conservation, that's the term that we refer to that, to, to that, that, that activity. But it also means a lot of things, you know, it re references the amount of time my family spent in Cuba, which actually wasn't all that long. If you think about it, it was 30 years more, almost 40 years from the time my grandparents arrived there to the time we left, and yet it completely formed our identities. That is a fantastic explanation, especially in, in the days of washing our hands and using hand sanitizer. It's a perfect way to understand it. Um, the title of your chapters is unusual too. Each is titled with a material, not 
a story. So why did you do that? Well, the inspiration for this book came from Primo Levi's masterwork, The Periodic Table. Primo Levi, in, as many of you will know, was an Italian Jewish chemist uh, who lived in the Piedmont region of Italy in Torino, and he was uh, deported to Auschwitz. But he, he wrote many memoirs about the war and the tragedy of the Holocaust, but he wrote this one luminous little memoir called The Periodic Table in the 1970s, I think it was, that just talked about his life as a chemist. And he used that as a framing metaphor for his family story. And when I read that book for the first time, I thought this is the way to tell a conservation story. And I, what I do is I substitute materials for the elements. That's so clever. And it's such a great way to integrate what you're doing. It's fantastic. Your previous books, though, were arguably uh, industry-related, and they were nonfiction. This book is a journey of your difficult childhood in Miami, among those who have suffered losses in the Cuban Revolution, and also in the Holocaust. How did you come to write such a personal memoir, and why? So I started this journey as trying to write a book about conservation, because our field is very little understood, and there have never been any books written about it. Our work appears here and there. You know, it appears in Daniel Silva's uh, novels. Mm -hmm. It'll appear in a, a nonfiction book about finding a painting, the, the you know, the lost Caravaggio or something like that. So conservation is tangential to those stories, mm -hmm. but never has a book been written about what we do, and more importantly, what it is to be this practitioner whose work is the repair of the material world and specifically its treasures. So that was my goal to unpack this work. And I knew that it needed a family story. I knew that it needed a, you know, like, you know, those books where the people were writing a few years ago where they were like cookbooks to figure out how to get vegetables into cupcakes so kids would eat it. <laughs> this was sort of my way of doing that to tell a family story to highlight a profession. And then of course, it became more personal during the writing because as my editors were saying to me, we want more family story, more personal story and going there isn't easy, right? But that's what I had to do. Very brave, very, very brave. Um, as a first generation American myself, my parents were both Holocaust survivors. I know only too well how that impacts the trajectory of your life. How did being born in Cuba and emigrating to the United States shape both your personal and professional life? So, well, that's kind of the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> it is, I know. Well, you, so give, give us a snapshot. <laughs> yeah. So I'm actually not first generation. I was born in Cuba. Right. I'm first generation. Mm -hmm. No, my parents were first generation Cuban. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so... I was born in Cuba. We left when I was four years old. I was a young child growing up in the United States. I was four years old. Miami doesn't look that different from Havana. And I remember having a distinct feeling as a little girl of what's the big deal? We're here. All of our friends are here. Everything looks exactly the same. I didn't understand, of course, what mm -hmm. was the, the backstory. And I spent a lot of my childhood, of course, dealing with my very challenging, complicated mother and feeling like, why are we so uh, upset about being in America? This is where everybody wants to be. We're here. We came through the front door, whereas most immigrants have to endure a lot of struggle to get into the United States. And all I wanted to do was get away, get away from Miami, get away from that Cuban nostalgia. But my profession, it was through my profession that I came back around to understanding that this extraordinary place where I was born, that my parents were born in, that we had to leave, was not just unique for our family, but unique in world history, or in certainly the history of the Western Hemisphere. And that's been ever since I went back to Cuba for the first time through conservation. And, and there's a lot of other stuff around that too, of course. The fact that I became a person who's life's work is dedicated to repair, to repair, to fixing what's broken, had so much to do with that exile story from the Cuban revolution. 
tell, tell us a little bit more about that, that, that how that influenced you. Well, you know, I didn't, it didn't actually influence me directly in the sense that I didn't become a conservator in order to repair a story. I became a conservator because, excuse me, well, I became a conservator because I was in college. I was a, a visual arts major. I had terrific technical skills, but I felt sort of like without what to say, without a story to tell in my art. And so I lucked into this profession through a profession through a professor who guided me in that direction. And it was almost like a thread that I followed. I became a conservator because I needed a profession. I needed to, to make a living. My parents did not have any money and my mother was extremely upset about that. So I knew that I needed financial independence and this led me in that direction. But it was like, I followed a path. I just kept following the path and it led me back to Cuba where I actually, for people who are here in LA, when I first went back to Cuba for the first time, what I did was I gave a paper on my work on the Watts Towers here in Los Angeles. And the influence was indirect, but it's it, it's even, you know, and actually it has to do with the way this whole book came about, which I'd be glad to tell you about too, if you want, but it's sort of following a path as it went and, and it just, led me into these places that had so much to do with my origins. That's really such an unusual story. Do tell us how that book came about. So this is how this book came about. It's the pan. So I had been thinking about this since I first read Primo Levi's book. I want to tell a memoir about conservation. I want to write about conservation, but I didn't have the, the, the story yet to tell. I didn't have the, that narrative. So whatever, I didn't think about it too much. Then the and I was running this large scale conservation practice in LA and Miami, um, and writing, but not writing too much because I was working so much. The pandemic happens, everything shuts down. I'm sitting here in my house in this very room that I'm in, <laughs> and um, I decided to take an online writing course with Sarah Lawrence College, one of their online adjunct you know courses, and I started to write this novel about Cuba in the 50s, about a nightclub, whatever, and fiction's really hard, by the way. It is. So, yeah. And as I'm writing this story about this nightclub with a showgirl and a set of brothers who are vying for this, that, and the other, into the story, out of the blue, appears a Romanian Jewish paintings conservator who studied in Rome Get this, he studies in Rome in the 1930s and has to flee to Havana. And I'm like, who are you? And what are you doing here in Havana in the 50s? I was totally flummoxed by this guy who showed up. But I also know enough to know that when you get that kind of little gift from the muse, you can't just discard it. So I hired a book coach to work with me on this novel to figure out how to braid all these things together. And... Um, the book, I casually mentioned the idea for the memoir to the book coach, and she said, okay, you need to stop what you're doing and write this memoir. My father had died, by the way, in 2019, and that kind of allowed for this story to be told, because it would have been harder to do this with him alive. He would have taken it personally in a way that my mother didn't. Anyway, I wrote the book proposal. And, and my uh, book coach said to me, oh my God, this book proposal is amazing. Everybody's going to want it. Nobody wanted it. I could get no agent interested because the agent that I had for Tropicana Nights and I parted ways. So I have no, no agent right now, if anybody's out there and wants to represent me. But um, so I uh, put it aside. Nobody wanted it. I put it aside. And then what happened was that particular book coach became an editor at this publisher, this new, very robust publishing company called Row House. And they called me one day and they said, we heard about this, can we read it? Long story short, they called me the next day and said, we want to buy it, but here's the catch. You have to write it within the next, we need it by November, which would have been, was in 10 months. Oh my goodness. How did so, you accomplish that? Well, I said to them, look, let me call you back tomorrow. Let me see if that's a real possibility. And I went home and I laid it all out. I, I, you know, I laid out a map of the year. 
I laid out, you know, weeks to have a cold and weeks to for Jewish holidays and this, that and the other. And I realized that I could do it. It was absolutely doable if I could if I wrote 370 words a day, six days a week. Now, I actually wrote way more than that. But that's it just dropped out of the sky. You know, I thought things do not drop out of the sky like that. And when they do, it's it it behooves one to reach for them if it's possible. So that's how that well, happens. that that kind of determination really is um, a hallmark of your story, isn't it? Um, so before we get to that, because I really want to talk about your resilience and and how you overcame some of the things that really would have felled a lesser person, I want to ask you a Jewish related story. So one of the guiding principles of Judaism is tikkun olam. You're a Jew. You were a Jew in Havana. You're a Jew in a profession that doesn't have a lot of Jews, I'm guessing. How did your Judaism impact the work that you do, your resilience, and your determination? Tell us about that. Okay. There's many different ways to tell that story, but I'll I'll tell you one in particular. When I was young and growing up in Miami, and I was growing up with this difficult family situation. I mean, it wasn't the worst family situation in the world either. I just had a very volatile, mercurial, abusive mother who adored me, but was herself very, very wounded and, and incapable of controlling her anger when she was afraid. So I lived in a world where it was like, you know, there were boxes of matches all around and anyone could light and it would explode. I never knew who I was going to come home to when I was a child. And through a series of, you know, whatevers, because in Cuba, you sent your kids to a religious school, a Methodist, mm -hmm. Catholic, Jewish. My parents sent me to the local Jewish elementary school, which was an Orthodox elementary school, but it was like, you know, back when Orthodoxy wasn't so far to the right, when it was, you know, and I went to this Orthodox Jewish day school and I became friends with a lot of these girls my age. And I remember going home for the, with them, you know, we'd sleep over each other's houses. And when I would go home with them for the weekend, there would always be like Friday afternoon, incredible chaos, sometimes fights, sometimes sibling rivalries, sometimes the parents angry at each other. And then the candles would be lit and it would end. It would just go to calm and peace and beauty and dinner and singing. And I thought, wow, wow. Mm -hmm. Something can be put in place, a rule, a, a framework can be put in place that supersedes even your deepest anger and pain. And that to me is, is, the, is the way Judaism most influenced my resilience. Well, that is a, that's an incredible answer. And so the picture you paint is so vivid. I mean, you can see it in the home. Um, how did, you did suffer through intensely difficult situations. How did you seriously overcome those both personally and professionally. You had a fractious relationship with your parents, especially your, your mother. Um, and you referenced that you could not have written this book while your father was still alive. So yeah. how did you, oh, there they are. There they are, there they are. That's just to give you an idea of who these, so this is my family within a few, you know, like the, in the first year of our coming to the United States, the five people in that picture are beginning on the right, my uncle Enrique, the bald guy, that's my father's brother. My uncle Felix, who's my mother's brother and was only 15 years older than I was. Um, I say was because he passed away. My mother, my father to her left, and then me in the front. So it's my two uncles and my parents and me. We all shared a one bedroom apartment. And um, she was just tormented because, you know, my mother was very poor. And the, the whole story begins with her poverty mm -hmm. and her being raised in an orphanage and how uh, um, distressing that was to her. And when they, and, my, and marrying my father brought her a modicum of safety. And when that safety was pulled away because of the Cuban mm -hmm. revolution, 
she just just felt f fear just closing in on her and I don't know because you know no one's ever psychoanalyzed her but you know I in my mind I think to myself she was afraid she had been brutalized as a child herself and you know how you have a way of repeating those patterns mm -hmm. and so she, you know she would take out her anger on me for anything that happened or didn't happen tiny thing I didn't want to eat you know your kids they don't want to eat kids don't want to eat put some food down on the table and you're like I don't want that that would just set her off into just crazy anger and um I was pretty how did I overcome it well therapy <laughs> sure there are therapists here thank you for your service <laughs> you know? um Lots of therapy, some better than others, but lots of therapy, but it took a long time. And also, I mean, it's continuous, but also getting away because moving away was important. Um, I never abandoned them. There was never a year where I didn't see my parents or visit them. The only time, I mean, when I was that year I spent in Rome at the American Academy was the only time I didn't visit them more than one time in mm -hmm. a year. And, um, because you know the the uh, the idea of family was kind of baked in. It was baked into my my genetic material, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, the you know the whole notion of family in Cuba, family here in the United States, being together. Even though, of course, my family is small. I'm sure we have tons of cousins somewhere, but. Um, they didn't get along with anybody, right? And I have to believe it was that my mother didn't get along because my mother would take any slight so personally. You know, she still does to this day, although she's kind of, you know, she's she's lost a little steam because she's 91 and a half. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, she loves to tell the story about how, like, when I went to college, I went to Brandeis. When I went to college, we had a cousin in Boston who was a pianist or something like that. And that I called them to see if they were uh, available. And that they said to me, we don't have any cousin named Rosa Lowinger. And like, that might have happened, but it might have been some mistake. Who knows? My, but my mother immediately went to like, I'm never talking to these people again. But it's a dist distance therapy and also knowing somehow, maybe it was the work of repair, knowing that the work of repair is the work of understanding the object, in my case, conservation, the mm -hmm. object, you have to understand the object, how it was made, what's, what it's made out of, how did it break, how many times is it broken? That whole history is, is part of understanding whether you can actually repair something and and somehow I saw my way to that also within the personal story. I just didn't want to abandon my family. You know, I had a really, really good friend that I write about in the book who did have to abandon her family because they were a couple of notches more toxic. And the thing about mine is even though they were so toxic, but the the foundation, the crust of that pie was baked with love. And, and that never was, that never went away. That That's encouraging, I'm sure, to many people who have issues with family that tear them apart, and yet they want to hold on. Um, your parents were against this career, were they not? It's not that they were against it. It's that like, it, you know, it was out of their understanding. I my, No one in my family had ever gone to college. My, you know, everybody was, they were merchants. They were, you know, my mother worked in a, in stores. My mother worked from the time she was five years old, really, but she worked, they worked in stores. They were merchants. They were poor Eastern Europeans. My parents scraped together the money to send me to college because, and allowed me to go away, which was not a small thing. Mm -hmm. And I... And they thought an art career, how how crazy is that? But they also recognized that I had this this ability, this talent, if you will. And when I said I wanted to become an art conservator, they were like, whatever, you know, you 
you know, like they would have loved it if I had become an education specialist or, you know, a doctor, they would have loved that. Like when I was telling them that I was taking all these science classes to go into this art profession, they were like, whatever. But, you know, it's that they didn't understand it. They had no way of understanding it. Mm -hmm. To repair things, repairing old things and repairing them in a way where you retain some of the damage as part of its history and keep it so that it's reversible. These are kind of esoteric ideas, right? Absolutely. Uh, when did they recognize that you were at the top of your field and a success? I think it was, a little, it was really far down the line. It was, uh, I think the Rome Prize kind of mm -hmm. um, woke them up a little bit, even though, again, they had no idea what that was. Um, well, tell us a little bit about that because maybe okay. some of our our audience doesn't know either. And it's an okay. incredibly prestigious, um, it is, it, incredibly it, prestigious. It's like the, it's like the greatest gift ever. So the American, Acad the American Academy in Rome is an institution that awards fellowships to scholars in a series of different fields, archaeology, classical studies, modern Italian studies, you know, mm -hmm. art history of various iterations and to artists, architects. It was it was designed originally to be a place where you could where architects and artists could go do the grand tour, right? Mm -hmm. But so it's architects, musicians, uh, you know, composers, uh, visual artists, filmmakers, architects, landscape architects, and historic preservation and conservation specialists. These are funded uh, fellowships given by individuals. Now, every country has their own uh, academy in Rome. There's the French Academy, the British Academy, the Spanish Academy, the Japanese Academy. The United States is the only country whose academy is privately funded. It's not a government agency. So I got the, I got the prize in historic preservation and conservation, which Back then, not so much now, back then was way easier to get than say the the literature prize. That was like, that's really hard to get. Mm -hmm. um, but I got it and I didn't get it on my first try. It's one of those things where you have to apply. And I uh, wrote, you write, a, you write a proposal for an idea that you wanna work on. And I had been doing a lot of work back then in public art for public art agencies. You know, I still do. My firm does public art work for the city of Beverly Hills, the city of LA, uh, LA County and mm -hmm. Kansas City, Dallas, all over the country. And one of the things that struck me was that in thinking about public art, a lot of what we dealt with was trying to keep the work safe from the very public it's intended to serve from vandalism, keep it free of vandalism. And so I became kind of obsessed with vandalism. What does it mean? The unauthorized attack on works of art or public space. You know, some of it was the knocking down of statues. We weren't too far away from the Bamiyan Buddha destruction. Um, that kind of deliberate destruction of culture in order to, to have an impact, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. So... I, th I wrote this proposal to study vandalism and they gave it to me. And so I spent a year in Rome studying vandalism. Well, so that kind of gave, woke my parents up, but really what woke them up and made them think, oh, was when our firm started getting tons of work and they could see big projects. And mm -hmm. especially when I opened a branch of the practice in Miami and they could see me in the new, I was in the Miami Herald, I would be on television these, you know, I'd say to them, you know, that building that's down there, it's historic or whatever, or the fountain blue or whatever. And so then they started to see it. <laughs> You've already talked a little bit about how you came to a, a place of understanding with your mother, which is really, I mean, as a, in terms of uh, your life's work, that has to be top on the list, right? But a recent art restoration project which everyone is talking about, caught the imagination of the public is Luna Luna, which is the rebirth of an amusement park with pieces that were originally designed by well-known artists such as Dolly and Basquiat and Herring. And in 1987, it was on display in Germany and was packed up into shipping containers and sat in those shipping containers for over th three decades until a partnership including the musician Drake, himself a nice Jewish boy, um, put money into restoring it 
and having it go on display here in Los Angeles. I'm sure that many of our audience has seen it. I am about to go on Sunday. Um, and I'd love to hear about your role in that project. So um, it was uh, January of 2022, right when I was starting to write Dwell Time, just right before I started to write Dwell Time. I got a call from this. And by the way, that's an image of me working on a mosaic from a building in Miami Beach, not Luna Luna. Luna Luna's coming. Oh, okay. Good. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah. That's, a, that's another great project, my, that Miami Beach project. So it's January 22. I'm sitting in my studio here. I got a call from this art handler who used to work for Gagosian who says to me, Rosa, we've got this project um, and we need your help. And I said, what is it? He said, I can't tell you. I said, okay. He said, you got to sign the NDA before I can even tell you. And I sort non of- Non-disclosure agreement. Right, non-disclosure agreement. And I said, all right, I, I don't like that. You know, the art world is very full of itself in that way. Mm -hmm. But um, I, and he, but he said to me, trust me, you want to do this. And so then I, I signed the, the NDA. I went to the warehouse in East LA and it was this- magical thing i couldn't believe it uh of these works of art they are amusement park rides historic amusement park rides like that they <clears throat> that this empresario andre heller bought up in the 1980s but they were from like the 50s and 40s and 30s and he hired the top artists of the day to create this carnival environment for children it was it, it was a way of bringing art to the masses and particularly into the eyes of children and these pieces were beautiful and mm -hmm. they hired me to kind of help figure out the conservation questions not for for the right not for the mechanical components of the rides themselves but for mm -hmm. the painted finishes mm -hmm. for, the, for the sculptures for the painted finishes and it was fabulous i worked with their team for two years i was just there the other day with some friends and colleagues from the getty to show them around and it's it's wonderful. If you haven't gone and you're in LA, go. They I think they really are going to close on May 12th because you know they're starting to think about their next venue, but it's beautiful. It it really has a spirit unlike anything else. Well, in that vein, um which of your many projects was the most meaningful to you? Well, that's always a, you know, a loaded question because sometimes things are meaningful because they are this uh, uh, sort of Hail Mary pass where you're just saying, this is, I don't see how we're going to get this done, but then you throw it and you do it in that mosaic that we just showed you was mm -hmm. really wonderful. It is a, it is a mosaic that used to be on the facade of a hotel in Miami beach called the Versailles hotel. And it's the Apollo mosaic and it was torn off the building by developers who were going to develop this into a hotel, saying what developers always do, that it's not possible to fix it, yada, yada. As it turns out, the city of Miami Beach got behind fixing it, and it's wonderful. But that, but the truth is, really, it would have to be the work I did in Haiti after the, after the major earthquake, where I was brought in by something called the Smithsonian Haiti Recovery Project, to help rescue these murals that were on the walls of the Episcopal Cathedral of Port-au-Prince. Cathedral had collapsed around the murals and out of 14, there were only three left. Mm -hmm. And these were, these were vernacular life of Christ murals that depicted Haitian people and Haitian scenes in these stories like the baptism or the last supper. And, getting those off the wall safely under these dire conditions and seeing the gratitude of the, of our Haitian work partners that we would be doing this work was, was really, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot because during the process, I questioned the, the value of what we were doing because there was so much human misery in the city at that moment. And I thought, is this really how we should be spending resources? And I got, uh, you know, I got a uh, talking to from the team. They said, we have lost everything. And our culture is the one thing that we cannot afford to lose. 
So was- that story, that story in your book was so moving and, and really a jolt when you read it, because of course you think, why, why are they worried about this when they don't have a place to eat, a place to sleep, a place to bathe? But in fact, the it's culture- cholera raging. You know? right. Exactly. Exactly. So as a final, as a final wrap up, um, before I throw it to Susan for Q and A of, of our audience, here's here's my last question: If an art conservator and restorer is expert at her craft, nobody knows that she was there, unless they've seen. Oh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> they just know that the piece is better than it was before she worked on it. Right. Tell me how you feel about that. Can you bring something to its original, uh, back to its original uh, condition, or do you not even want to do that? It depends because each type of conservation has its own ethos. So for example, with contemporary and modern art, you want to bring it back to what the living artist wants it to be. And therefore it sometimes is a question of intervening very heavily in order to attain that perfection. But you wouldn't do that at an archaeological site. You wouldn't go to an archaeological site, dig up mosaics, and expect that they would look like the way they did originally. You wouldn't do that. You don't do that with bronzes, for example, where that are in an outdoor environment where their variation and patina is part of what they do. You do polish silver back to to an original condition, and it goes back. And and any work that is involved with ethnography you do not try to achieve a perfection that is one's artistic interpretation of what a work that has been in use. So it varies, you know, but contemporary art is its own thing. Well, that's a great way to understand it. It, Really, the answer is sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. (laughs) Thank you so much, Rosa. This was really a treat, I have to say, and to share your extraordinary story and a career with our audience. And I want to remind everyone to go to Rosa's website, where she has her book uh, available for sale. And also, we're going to put that link up in the chat. Rosa, as I said, I felt like I got to know you by reading your book. And it was such a treat to talk to you today. Thank you for coming. And thank you to everyone in the audience. And Susan, back to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you. Uh, yes, Rosa, I, I, I'm so excited now to ask for you some of the questions that have come up from our audience. Um, Adele at, uh, said very early on that she loved the book, loved Dwell Time, and uh, she wondered if you're working on your next book. Absolutely. First of all, I'm, yes, absolutely. I'm working on the novel where the Eastern European <laughs> Paintings Conservator showed up. I'm absolutely, I'm working on that. I've I'm deep in. I'm about two thirds done with the first draft. And uh, yes, I'm working on that. And I'm looking for another nonfiction project, but I think I have one kind of floating around in my head. Fantastic. Do you have a title for that upcoming book yet? Sometimes the title comes late, I know. So no, that that novel, the novel, the the novel's title is Paradiso Cabaret. Oh, what a great title. Paradiso Cabaret. That's fantastic. Um uh, I think I'm interested in uh, your next, I know you're very, very busy writing, but do you have any conservation projects coming up? Yes. Well, first of all, um, one of the things that I mentioned in the book is that I have turned over my practice to the next generation, to, conser- to conservators who uh, have, I, I, you know, I talked, it was a long process, but two conservators now own the practice in conjunction with a business affairs person. So the three of them run the practice and they are the new owners and I now work for them. So I have a number of different projects in process with them. Uh, You know, um, I'm working on a project for the Schindler House, the Mac Center up on Kings Road. We're working, our firm is working on the restoration of that building, but we're also working with the Mac Center that has uh, an artist in residency program here on Cochrane and the Mackey Apartments on Cochrane. That so that's a project that I'm working on. Um, I'm working on several projects with our Miami studio, and um, even though I'm not technically an, allowed to announce this yet, I will announce sort of 
here that I'm going to actually, I've been asked to teach for one semester at NYU. I'm going to teach in the fall of, of, of 2023. I'm going to teach at my old school at the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. Of course, it's a time when it's really hard to be on campus, right? But um, the Institute of Fine Arts is up by the Metropolitan Museum so, and it's graduate school. But, um, you know, these are complicated times and I sort of feel as a writer, you do want to be there. Oh, absolutely. And the fall, as you know, autumn in New York is a great time. And, um, you know, I, I think someone whose mission in life has been about repair and healing, you know, that's a good message to be putting out into the world and onto our campuses and in your teaching. So I think that's wonderful. Um, Adele also asked if your mother liked the book. Had she read it? Yes, my mother read the book. She read it twice. And the first time I gave it to her, by the way, she knew what I was doing all along because she shared a lot of the stories with me. You ah. know, we would sit together and she would tell me stories and I would hear her and she would tell me about the difficult things that she endured as a child and also some very sassy, hilarious stories about. So she knew where I was going. She knew what I was doing. And I even warned her, look, there were certain times in our lives when we had some trouble. And so... She knew what was coming. And then I gave it to her first out of order so that she didn't have the full impact of the narrative. I gave it to her so that the stuff that was mostly about her struggles as a child came first. Then I gave her the redemptive stuff at the end. And then I saved the hard middle for the. So I gave it to her out of order so that she could get comfortable. And then the second time she read it straight through and it was hard for her. It was hard. And I had to talk her down from feeling like, she, you know, she was just miserable. She just was like, not how could you do this to me at all? It was like, I was a monster. I was horrible. How could I have been that way? Why do you even speak to me? And I explained to her, the book is, if the book says anything, it's that you were not a monster. You were as much a product of your circumstances as anybody. And you've done everything you could you know, and it, the the act of writing the book and working with her on it has been it's an act of repair on its own. Oh, what a beautiful answer. And I have to say, I think that I see from comments in the chat that we're generating a lot of interest in your book. So uh, MJ, I'm going to uh, suggest that you post Rose's website again, because that's sort of got a great, yeah, we'll put it in the chat. Yeah. And I will say one thing, if you reach out to either Skylight Books or Books and Books and call them, they will give you a discount code. Skylight Books. I love Skylight <laughs> Books uh, up there on Vermont Avenue. I, I just, that's a, just one of our wonderful uh, Los Angeles bookstores. Um, since we're talking about Dwell Time, the book, uh, somebody else just asked, you know, who hasn't read it yet, but I think is going to read it now, um, <laughs> why you think the book would have been painful for your father? It's, it's so interesting. I tell a story in the book about my father and my mother and a one time incident that I had with them where I just let them have it and then left for Hawaii. And my mother, though she is trigger happy and gets angry really fast, she will also process and, and, and want to come back to, to repair. My mother has that baked into her. But my father doesn't like the airing of dirty laundry and he doesn't like things being said out loud. So even though he was sort of nominally the easier parent, he was actually sort of the difficult parent. Right. And that was something that I write about in the book that when I realized at a certain point, oh my God, these guys are in their late eighties. At a certain point, I'm going to be left with one of them. I thought, please leave me with the easier one, whichever one is, will help me. And I always thought it would be him, but it's not, it's her. Ah, so interesting. So interesting. Thanks for that. Um, and actually, I love something that you said to Olivia earlier about that the foundation was love. You know, I, I think people with difficult parents sometimes struggle to remember that. So I thought that was a beautiful message that you just shared with us in conversation. That's not um, true with all parents, by the way. Yeah. That's not true with all difficult parents, but some, those of us who hang on and want to fix it and feel the pain of it not being fixed, it's because it's there. Because it's right. 
Right, because it's there. Um, I think Danya asked if you, I, th I think I know the answer, but I want you to answer is if you've restored anything ever in Cuba. And Heidi actually asked in tandem with that if you speak Spanish, so. Completamente hablo español. Great. Y hablo perfectamente el español. So Heidi is also uh, a fluent, virtually native Spanish speaker of two uh, Argentine parents. So, uh, oh but you guys can take that off. We'll 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 take, yeah. that off take that. About, uh, tell us about Cuba. So, part of the thing about the book is that the minute I discovered Cuba, all I ever wanted to do was work there. And part of the whole story is how I was never able to actually achieve it that I've been trying but the embargo kept getting in the way and every time it looked like oh it's going to open up it's going to open up never happened but I have done a lot of work in back channels like I've talked to friends where I've you know the, um I don't know if anyone has been to Cuba and seen the phenomenal Bacardi building in downtown Havana that is glazed terracotta tile when they were restoring that building they didn't know how to deal with the glazed terracotta I couldn't work on it because of the embargo, but I, I wrote a, a detailed report for a friend of mine for how to do it. I worked, so I've never been able to work there, but I've always been trying. And, and recently I attended a big preservation conference there where they're aiming to deal with modernism because modernism is having real struggles there, but no, but I've taught there and I've written about it. So. Beautiful. That's wonderful. So, um, I suspect this will be my last question to you, although then I do uh, have some great and exciting uh, information to share. Oh, but we're getting a few more from the audience. So this is, uh, oh, Susan asks uh, if you still like roller coasters. <laughs> I've always actually liked roller coasters. Um, I like them. I just kind of feel like I'm at the age where I don't want to do anything like that. I don't need too many big thrills. Just like <laughs> I, I think we all feel the same way. <laughs> me and Olivia. Although if somebody really wanted me to ride a roller coaster with them, I I could rally. <laughs> I love that. So here is my uh, last question to you before I uh, make my closing remarks that I want everyone to stay for because I've got uh, something exciting to say. But um, is is there a dream project, like if you could have worked on anything in the world that you always wanted to work on, do you, do you have one of those, one of those aspirational projects? Well, it was, it would definitely, I mean, hands down without even having to think, it would definitely have been the Hotel Riviera in Havana, which was designed by a Miami-based architect, Igor Polovitsky and the Los Angeles interior decorator, Albert Parvin, and had all these beautiful, and has, it still has, all these beautiful mid-century modern decorative mosaics, concrete, mo marble, stone. So that's really the dream project. But, you know, there's always something extraordinary, right? I would have really liked to work on Graceland. I have to be honest. <laughs> that's kind of where my taste goes. Oh, I love that. Graceland. That's so, so great. Uh, Rosa, what a fantastic interview this has been with you. I feel like I know you personally now. <laughs> I, I'm so glad to have you sort of uh, in our braid family of artists now. Um, to be here. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. So um, before I send, uh, get ready to send the rest of you on your way for the rest of your Sunday, I want to say this. For those of you who voluntarily purchased a virtual ticket, we see you <laughs> and we are beyond grateful. Um, Anyone can make a donation and support our work at any time by going to the-braid.org, which is being posted in the chat. And uh, you can click on the word uh, on donations. Uh, this is an excellent time to be generous with the braid because we are coming to the end of our fiscal year. No donation is too small or frankly, too large. So if you've enjoyed <laughs> our programming and um, uh, like coming to our shows, by all means, uh, we appreciate all your donations. And for those of you who are here for the first time with us, you should definitely join our community. You can join our mailing list on our website and that link is being posted in the chat now too. And that is a way to be in touch with all the wonderful programming that we have uh, at the ready and ready to go. 
And here's why you should do that, because there are some upcoming events that we're excited about. We are actually doing a lovely free event at 5.30 today in the Pico Robertson area as young Jewish creatives and professionals gather around Seder tables and themes of the Seder plate will come alive through a candlelight storytelling where the Braid is presenting three really great stories with some wonderful actors There'll be food and discussion. It should be a wonderful event. And um, we'll put that link in the chat. It's on our schedule on our website. Needless to say, it's at 5.30. So it's the first thing on that schedule because it's coming up. And um, the absolute final salon show of this season is going to be really, really special. It's called What Do I Do With All This Heritage? And it features true stories of Asian Jews as they hold two age old traditions in their hearts. And there's a great feeling, you know, we're in, we've started rehearsal just very recently. And I have to say, I'm directing the show and there is a great feeling of Lador Vador in these stories um, of the next generation. They are moving and surprising hilarious and heartfelt. And there are tickets available for Los Angeles, the, uh, the San Fernando Valley, the South Bay and Northern California performances on our website. And uh, the link is gonna be posted in the chat for that. All of this is available, of course, on our website. Needless to say, our next Sunday with the Braid is being planned, it's in the works. So stay tuned for that and we will let you know. So finally, finally, I want to really thank our panelists, Rosa Lowinger. That was just an incredibly warm and insightful and beautiful conversation. Thank you so much, Rosa. Um, of course, I have some more thank yous. I wanna thank Olivia, who was our first time moderator, really asked fantastic questions, Olivia, great job. I want to thank Braid artist in Abby Freeman, artist in residence, Heidi Mendez, for that beautiful reading of excerpts from Rose's book. And um, to MJ Adamson for helping behind the scenes. We celebrate with you your upcoming graduation from USC and uh, brava to you. Stay safe. And uh, we're very happy for you. And finally, always, I thank Rhonda Spinak, who is our magnificent leader in all things that we do. And to all of you who uh, joined as part of our community today, have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. We look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.